lifts my eyes to the hills where my help is coming. All right, good to see everybody this morning. Glad that you're here. Good to have a new member to our class this morning, Brother Clay. Mr. Doris joined us last week. Brother Clay is here this week. He was here again for Brother uh, Joshua last week, I believe, about uh, glad that you're here, and I pray that God will bless us as we try to continue our study this morning. We began last week looking at the book of Obadiah. We're going to be looking at some of the shorter books of the Bible, uh, probably be looking at least at five or six different uh, really short books of the Bible and trying to get a very, very clear picture in our mind of what each of those short books of the Bible are about. Uh, so if you will turn your Bibles this morning to the book of Obadiah, the book of Obadiah, right. the, uh, the book of Obadiah is a vision that God gave to Obadiah, Obadiah was a, what we call a minor prophet, but every prophet that God calls is a major prophet, so we call them minor prophets because they're short books, and then the major books like Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, some of the longer books uh, we call the major prophets. Obadiah, the word, the name Obadiah means a worshiper or a servant of the Lord. A worshiper or a servant of the Lord. Uh, the book of Obadiah is a prophecy about the destruction uh, and the total of annihilation of, the, of Edom. Uh, now somebody tell me uh, from our the brief study last week, who were the Edomites? They were descendants of him. Esau. The descendants of Esau. Okay, so the Edomites were descendants of Esau. Now tell me anybody, uh, if you will, tell me anything you know about Jacob and Esau. Jacob and Esau. Twin brothers. Okay, they were twin brothers. Very good. Jacob and Esau were twin brothers. Let's go back to when they were conceived and they were still in the mother's womb uh, because this is the foundation that and the strife between Jacob and Esau and the deception that took place. All that is what led to the ultimate hatred of the Edomites against uh, Israel or Judah. Go with me to uh, back up in your Bibles, first of all, to Genesis, Genesis chapter 25. Start with verse 22 and read through verse 34. Uh, and, and stop after verse 22, explain what that's about, and then explain 23 through 34. Uh, Genesis chapter 25, read first just 22. The children struggled together within her, and she said, if it be so, why am I thus? Okay, who is the woman under consideration here? Who is the mother of Jacob and Esau? Rebecca, all right? So Jacob and Rebecca, uh, I mean, uh, Rebecca has two children in her womb, and as has already been stated, they're twins, and those two in her womb were struggling even while they were still in their mother's belly. It's amazing. But it tells you a lot about conception and life beginning at conception, and those two were struggling within the womb of their mother. Go ahead, verse 23. And the Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy wounds, two manner of people shall be shall be separated from thy bowels, and the one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. Okay. There is a prophecy right there about what? When he says the elder shall serve well first of all there were two nations, but what what did he mean when he said the elder shall serve the younger. What normally would have taken place? Okay, the older one would get the birthright and the younger would have to uh, take care of, help uh, provide for the elder, okay? But here he says the elder shall serve the younger. Go ahead, 24, read 24 through 34 now. And when her days to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb. First came out red all over like a hairy garment, and they called his name Esau. All right, stop right there. The name Edom means red. Okay, 
The Edomites were descendants of Esau. Esau was red. The Edomites were red. And uh, so uh, his name was called Esau. He was red. And he was hairy. What, what kind of uh, vocation did uh, Esau have? What kind of work did Esau do? He was a hunter. All right. Somebody said last week he was a redneck, hairy uh, South Georgia boy or something like that. Okay, that's Esau. All right, keep reading. And after that came his brother out, and his hand took a hold of Esau's heel, and his name was called Jacob. And Isaac was three score years old, and she bared him. And the boys grew, and Esau was a cunning hunter, a man of the field, and Jacob was a plain man dwelling in tents. And Isaac loved Esau because he did eat of his venison. But Rebecca loved Jacob. All right, stop right there. What's that saying uh, in verse 28? There was favoritism in the house. Yes, there was favoritism in the house. Everybody here, when we read about something like this in the Word of God, and it happens many times in the Scriptures, when you read about favoritism in a house, it ought to be a great warning to all parents, every one of us. Uh, it doesn't matter how young or how old your children are, you better be careful about showing favoritism to children in your family. Is it sometimes difficult not to show favoritism? <clears throat> Somebody tell me why we sometimes do show favoritism to children. They're okay, they're very different. Uh, come from the same bloodline, same environment, everything else the same, but children are different. You've got two children, they're different, a lot different. You've got three children, they're a lot different. Uh, you have six children, they're all different. Okay, and what is it about children that makes a parent tend to show favoritism towards a child. Personality. What do you mean by that? Some children mesh better with your personality. Okay. Some children mesh with your personality a lot better than the other children do. If you're strong-willed and you've got a strong-willed son, uh, you may have trouble either way. <laughs> I started to say <laughs> matching personalities don't necessarily uh, uh, solve a problem. But personalities, uh, in fact, if you're strong-willed and you've got a very compassionate child that wants to do what's right and wants to serve, uh, both my girls, they always, they wanted to do what was right. They wanted to do uh, what pleased their mom and dad in. And... Uh, they got very, very few whippings compared to what Marty got. Uh, it's hard not to show favoritism. Uh, the fact that I whipped Marty more than I did the girls doesn't mean I loved him less, does it? No. In fact, it takes a tremendous amount of love to discipline children. And when you see children that are walking contrary to God's word and they're rebellious and they're hard-headed, you better break that spirit. If you don't, uh, you, you and those children are headed for great trouble in their lives. So it's up to parents to control the children. Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction will drive it far from you. Train up the child in the way he should go. Uh, let not thy soul spare for his crying. Numerous scriptures that are important about disciplining children. But in spite of everything we do, and don't raise your hand, just think in your own heart and mind, those of you that have children, do you think you've ever shown partiality uh, towards one child? Do you ever, have you ever had a, quote, favorite child? Uh, you might have. It's always going to lead to trouble. It'll always show. Do you know other parents that you know that you, as you watch them, you see they show favoritism to one of the children? Have you ever seen that? Does it always cause trouble? Always. My parents like my sister a lot more than they did me. And I don't know why. Uh, they loved me, but I always felt like they loved her the most. Uh, I got a lot more whippings than she did. She could do something and start a fight, and I'd fight back, and boom, I'd get the whipping. Uh, now, 
they didn't love her more than they did me, but I just felt that way. You everybody understand that? Be careful, please be careful about showing partiality to your children. I, I think you have to protect your kids from other people showing them partiality too. Say it again. I think you have to protect your kids from other people like grandparents or other yes. people who are showing your child or one of the siblings partiality over the others as well. Yeah, I, I think so. I think that sometimes grandparents do uh, show partiality and they have a favorite uh, I heard one grandfather here say I tell you I like and he, and he almost said the particular grandchild the best and then he said well, I, I'm not supposed to feel that way uh, but we all have to be careful every one of us have to be careful about showing partiality okay alright so who loved Esau the most who loved Esau the most? Jacob. Why did Jacob, according to this picture, why did Jacob love Esau the most? What was one of the reasons? Say it again. Yeah, why did Isaac love Esau the most? Why did the scripture indicate he loved Esau the most? Say it again. All right, he liked the venison. He liked the meat. He liked uh, the fact that he was a hunter. And, uh, uh, Jacob was a plain man. He dwelt in tents. Esau went out in the woods, hunted, brought him, brought his daddy venison, and that made him special to his daddy. All right, keep reading. And Jacob saw the pottage, and Esau came from the fields, and he was faint. All right, tell me, why would Esau have come from the field faint? He'd yeah. probably been hunting at least all day, maybe two or three days. Hunting back then wasn't like it is today. They didn't have high-powered rifles, and every time they saw a deer, they didn't get a deer. Uh, so probably he had been hunting all day or several days and had not killed a deer, not gotten any meat. So he comes home, and he's faint. He's about to perish. Go ahead, verse 30. And Esau said to Jacob, Feed me, I pray thee, with a fat same, same red pottage. Where I am faint, therefore his name was called Edom. Okay, now we're talking about in the book of Obadiah, we're talking about the destruction of whom? The Edomites, descendants of Esau. Esau, his name is called Edom. What else is Edom called besides Esau? What else is Edom, the land of Edom? What what else was it called besides Esau? And Edom, what was the other name? Uh, not, there were two other names that uh, Edom was known by, sister. Go ahead. Mount Seir. Mount Seir. Now, when we say Mount Seir, we're not really just talking about one mountain. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. I'm not going to go into that. So it's called Edom. It's called Esau. It's called Mount Seir. And it's called Teman. That's what the land uh, that we're talking about, Edom, is going to be destroyed it's called Esau, uh, Mount Seir, Edom, and Teman. All right, go ahead, verse 31. So Esau comes home, he's starving, he's faint, he's weak. Verse 31. Jacob said, Silver is today thy birthright. And Esau said, Behold, the Lord's hand has been upon me. And Esau said, Behold, I am at the point to die. What profit shall this birthright do to you? Okay, what's Esau's feeling right here when... Jacob has said, sell me your birthright. Yeah, the birthright's not doing me any good. I'm fixing to die without some meat, without some food. So he says, I'll sell you my birthright if you'll give me some food. The Word of God makes this statement uh, that we, we ought to be praying that we might not have so much that we get proud and we might not have so little that we would steal for food. That's not the quote, but that's the essence of one verse of scripture. Everybody hear that? Uh, the prayer ought to be in our hearts. Don't give me so much that I become proud, and don't give me so little that I steal for food. Okay? So at this point, Esau is so hungry, starving, he's willing to sell his birthright. 
Go ahead now, verse 33, 34. And Jacob said, Swear to me this day, and he swear unto him, and he sold his birthright unto Jacob. And Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentil, and he did eat and drink, and rose up, and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Okay, thus Esau despised his birthright. Now then, go about ten pages past that. Go to uh, Genesis chapter 36 very quickly. Genesis chapter 36. Why are we talking about Jacob and Esau? Why are we talking about Jacob and Esau? Good book, book of Obadiah, what's it about? The destruction of what? The destruction of Edomites, who were descendants of Esau. And why did God destroy the Edomites? Because of the hatred they had for whom? The Jews, Israel. Right. Okay, so the descendants of Jacob were hated by the Edomites. And we know why they hated them to some degree, but there are a lot of other reasons that we'll look at. Genesis chapter 36, listen to verses 8 and 9. Genesis 36, 8 and 9. Thus dwelt Esau in Mount Seir. Esau is Edom. Okay, explain the three things there. Why did we come there? Esau dwelt in Mount Seir, and Esau is Edom. Now read verse 9. And these are the generations of Esau, the father of the Edomites, in Mount Seir. Okay, and then it goes on and describes who they were. Now, go back to the book of Obadiah, very quickly. Go back to the book of Obadiah. The first 16 verses of the book of Obadiah are about the certainty of the destruction of the Edomites. The first six, well, the first nine verses are about the certainty of the destruction, and the verses 10 through 16 are about the cause of the destruction. Everybody hear what I just said? The first nine verses is just, Edom is going to be destroyed. God declared, I'm going to destroy it. Look at verses, <coughs> verses 8 and 9 to read. Obadiah, verses 8 and 9. Shall I not in that day, saith the Lord, even destroy the wise men out of Edom, and understanding out of the mount of Esau? And thy mighty men of Teman shall be dismayed to the end that every one of the mount, every one of the mount of Esau may be cut off by slaughter. Okay, so what is God declaring the certainty of in verses 8 and 9? Uh, they're going to be destroyed. Verse 10 describes it even more. Go ahead and read verse 10. For thy violence against thy brother Jacob shall cover thee, and thou shalt be cut off forever. Okay, thou shalt be cut off forever. So you got three verses, verses 8, 9, and 10. They're talking about the certainty of the destruction of the Edomites. Now, verses 11 through 16 are talking about the reason that God says he's going to destroy the Edomites. There are... Well, let me back up. There are two main things that are described in the book of Obadiah. There are two main reasons the Edomites were going to be destroyed. Does anybody know what the two main reasons? Now, there are, there are eight or nine reasons mentioned in verses uh, 11 through 16. There are eight or nine, eight or nine reasons listed there. They all fo fall under one category. But there was another reason that was mentioned in the very beginning of the book of Obadiah about why they were going to be destroyed. What was the first main reason that they were going to be destroyed? Pride. Pride. Okay, look at verse uh, 3, Obadiah, verse 3. Read that. The pride of thine heart hath deceived thee, thou that dwellest in the clefts of the rock, whose habitation is high, that saith in his heart, Who shall bring me down to the ground? The, though thou exalt thyself as the eagle, and Though thou set thy nest among the stars, thence will I bring thee down, saith the Lord. Okay, so what does God say in Obadiah verses 3 and 4 is the reason, the first reason he lists as to why Edom is going to be destroyed. Because they're putting themselves above everybody and everything. Okay. So what was the first lesson that we talked about from the book of uh, Obadiah? The first lesson about parents and children. What was the first lesson we talked about? No Don't show favoritism. Okay. Now the second lesson that we're talking about is the danger of pride. 
Do we sometimes have to guard ourselves against the favoritism of children? Do we have to guard ourselves against pride? Is it easy to get lifted up in vain pride? When do we tend to be more full of pride? Let's take children, for example. When do you tend to be more proud of children? When do you tend to be more proud of children? When they do right. Say it again. When they do right. When they do right. Okay. Give me another. It, it might come under when they do right, but give me another reason. We sometimes get proud, and proud pride is wrong, but why do we get proud of children sometimes? So they do a good job, yes. You got, you got two children, and you tell them to go clean up, and we'll say both of them have a, a room. You go watch the girls' room when it's cleaned up. You watch the boys' room when it's cleaned up. What are you probably going to see? What are you probably, possibly going to see? The girl's going to get it clean. The boys say, I don't see anything wrong with this. It looks clean to me. Uh, so then what does that tend to cause with the parents? Favoritism. Uh, so pride, we can become proud for many, many different reasons. The more we accomplish, the more likely we are to be proud. The more we accomplish, the more likely we are to be proud. What was that song that uh, somebody wrote? It's hard to be humble. What? When you're, say, when you're perfect in every way. Yeah. It's hard to be humble when you're perfect in every way. That was a, a song that uh, it really expresses a lot of truth, doesn't it? Isn't it difficult to be humble when you're being blessed by God? When did Nebuchadnezzar get lifted up in vain pride? when he was blessed abundantly by God, all through the pages of God's Word. Peter was no doubt blessed to preach in a marvelous way. He didn't have much education, but he sure could preach. But what did he do then? Got lifted up in what? Pride. And being blessed to preach could have been one of the reasons he got lifted up in pride. All of us have to guard against pride. All of us have to guard against showing partiality uh, to children. All right, let's... let's uh, Leave the pride now. We talked about two main things that from the book of Obadiah that we need to remember. One is don't show partiality to children. Number two is be careful about pride. Name four things that we can become proud of. Anybody name four things. We've already mentioned children, but name four more things that might cause us to be full of pride. Say it again. Well, having a lot of money. And we might say, oh, we don't have a lot. Yeah, we do. We do. We have a lot of money. Well, there's one thing. What's another reason we might get proud? You lift it up in pride. Position. Position. Okay. What's another reason? Third. Stunning good looks. <laughs> you should have seen him smile, anyway. <laughs> Stunning good looks. He's had to struggle with that all his life. <laughs> Stunning good looks. He and I both have had to struggle with that. <laughs> all right? Stunning good looks. Well, <laughs> that's good, though, all right. And you think that's funny, but you'd be amazed at how many of us think we look good. I don't see myself as I am in the mirror. When I look in the mirror, I see me when I was 25 years old. We're not that way anymore. Uh, so stunning good looks can call, or you're thinking that you've got stunning good looks. What's another thing that might cause you to be proud? Abilities. Abilities, talents, gifts. And where do we get all those talents and gifts and abilities? We get them from God, but we sometimes get proud because of our talents and gifts. And when we are proud of what we do or what we accomplish, we tend to look down on people that aren't as gifted as we are. We become just like the Pharisee and the publican that went into the temple to pray. How many of you have ever looked down on somebody else? Have you ever looked down on somebody else? One hand went up. Got one honest person in the room. We've all, every one of us, I think, I know that we sometimes look down on other people. What causes us to look down on other people? Pride of ourselves, right. 
And we find the faults in other people, but all we see is the good things in our lives. Okay, so pride. Now then, let's go to the other eight or nine reasons that God says he's going to destroy Edom. What was the first main reason list, listed in verses 3 and 4? Pride. Now we're going to look at eight or nine more reasons. God, God says is the reason he's going to destroy the Edomites. Starting with verse uh, 11. Starting with verse 11. Well, anybody want to just name some of them? Somebody just name some of the reasons God listed that he was going to destroy the Edomites. Listed in verses 11 uh, through 16. Name anyone. Okay, uh, they mocked the calamity uh, of Judah or Israel. They, they mocked at their cousins, so to speak. Uh, and they laughed when trouble came into their lives. Let's let's go ahead and read verse eleven and twelve. <laughs> Look at uh, Obadiah, verses 11 and 12. Read those two verses and explain those two. In the day that thou stoodest on the other side, in the day that the strangers carried away captive his forces, and foreigners entered into his gates. His pronoun he is referring to Israel or Judah, right? He, he's saying, in the day that Israel and Judah were having trouble, here's what you were doing. All right? In the day... In the day that the strangers carried away captive his forces. Talking about Judah and Israel. Go ahead. The porters entered into his gates and cast lots upon Jerusalem, even thou wast as one of them. Okay, what does that mean? They were some of those standing there uh, doing those things that were being accused of. Yes. Okay, verse 12. But thou shouldest not have looked on the day of thy brother in the day that he became a stranger, neither shouldest thou have rejoiced over the children of Judah in the day of their destruction. Neither shouldest thou have spoken proudly in the day of distress. Okay, now, I know you could name two or three different things there, but name one main reason that God is saying here that the Edomites were going to be destroyed. One main reason. It's contained really in all three of those verses. They sat by and watched. Okay, they sat by and watched. Worse than that. They rejoiced. Now. They rejoiced. There you are. Go to... Uh, where is that word rejoice? Uh, yeah. Uh, Neither shouldest thou have rejoiced over the children of Judah in the day of their destruction. So what's a great warning to us in our lives connected with that? When people we don't like get brought down to be happy about it. Yes. Yes. We better be careful Better be careful about boasting and getting proud and rejoicing over the calamity of other people. Better be careful about that. If you've got a major enemy and trouble comes, don't you kind of have to fight against rejoicing? I think some of us do anyway. Some of us do. All right, start with verse uh, 13 now. Start with 13. Read 13 and 14. <coughs> Thou shouldest not have entered into the gate of my people in the day of their calamity. Yea, thou shouldest not have looked on their affliction in the day of their calamity, nor have laid hands on their substance in the day of their calamity. Neither shouldest thou have stood in the crossway to cut off those of his that did escape. Neither shouldest thou have delivered up those of his that did remain in the day of the stress. Okay, stop there. There was not one day or one week or one month that all of these things happened. This is over a series of quite a number of years. And what God is doing is God is going back and he's enumerating, okay, in this generation, here's what you did. In this generation, here's what you did. But all the way through this passage, he is enumerating Various things the Edomites did against Judah and against Jerusalem. And he's telling them one reason after another. And every one of these reasons that God's giving for the destruction of Edom is a lesson for us. Why is it a lesson for us? What does it show that God would go all the way back to the history of Edom and how they dealt with Judah 
and enumerate time after time, thing after thing they did, what does that tell us? It tells us a lot. You can name one thing it tells us. Maybe the little things we do over time add up. Okay. A lot of little things sometimes add up. Okay. Uh, a day is a thousand years. Okay. A day is a thousand years. A thousand years a day. Judgment's coming. Judgment's coming. Okay. People that grudge against somebody, your kids are going to see that and pass that on. <laughs> okay. When you're holding a grudge against somebody, uh, they, your kid's going to see that? Even, they have even less reason, not that it's okay for you to hold that grudge, but that second generation has no real reason. A lot of times they don't even know why they're mad. They don't know why they hate them. Okay? God is not a slack. That's something that kind of slack. Okay. God is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness. God is going to carry out judgment, and God did carry out judgment. Okay? Tell me what, if you were to summarize what we've talked about so far. Well, read one more verse. Read 15, uh, 15 and 16. For the day of the Lord is near upon all the heathen, as thou hast done, it shall be done unto thee. Okay, now some people feel like and that could be. Uh, to pick out the main verse in this in this book, that's one of them. That's one of them. Uh, the other one would be verse 10. For thy violence against thy brother Jacob, shame shall cover thee, and thou shalt be cut off forever. That's one of the main verses. Verse 15 is another main verse. Uh, the day of the Lord is near upon all the heathen. As thou hast done, it shall be done unto thee. Give me any other scriptures that teach that same truth. As thou hast done... It shall be done unto thee. Galatians. Say it again. Galatians. Yes, Galatians 6, verses 7 and 8. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. Exact same teaching as is right here. He says, As thou hast done, it shall be done unto thee. Thy reward shall return upon thine own head. Okay? Verse 16. For as ye have drunk upon the holy mountain, so shall all the heathen drink continually. Yea, they shall drink, and they shall swallow down, and they shall be as though they had not been. Okay. Now then, what are the first nine verses in the book of Obadiah about? What are the first mm -hmm. nine verses? Give me one statement that we made. first nine verses are about the blank of the destruction of Edom. The first nine verses are about the blank of the destruction of Edom. The certainty, right. The first nine verses are about the certainty of the judgment of Edom. Verses 10 through 16 are about the cause of the destruction of Edom. And then in verse 17, what is 17 starting to talk about? It's the blessings on Mount what? Zion. Blessings on Mount Zion, Israel, or Jacob. So the first 16 verses are about the destruction of Edom. And then starting in verse 17 talks about the blessings on Mount Zion or Jerusalem uh, or Israel or Jacob. Okay? Thank you all for being here.